Thank you for coming to the launch of what's the 15th year of Edelman's Trust Barometer. Uh, as you know, the Trust Barometer measures trust in institutions, leaders, business sectors, politicians, <coughs> business activities, media sources, the creators of content. We survey 33,000 people in 27 countries and each year draw upon a richer and richer data set. Now, there are two groups that we look at. The first is the informed public, 25 to 64-year-olds, college educated, top quartile income, significant consumption of media. We also then measure attitudes of the general public. Now, I'm absolutely delighted, actually, to see such a kind of high-powered group here this morning. It's, of course, a reflection of the level of interest and the quality of our speaker, Sir John Soares, uh, the former head of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. Now, we're going to hear from Sir John shortly in what is his first address since stepping down. But first, our global chief executive, Richard Edelman, is going to give you an overview of this year's global findings. After that, I'm going to give you a quick picture of the UK data. I think that will take 15, 20 minutes. We'll then go to Sir John, and then there will be uh, time for Q&A. So, Richard. I have my Davos boots on. Just in case I lose my luggage. Um, OK, so here are the findings. Um, we've been doing this now for 15 years. And um, the long trends are NGOs up, media in gradual descent, government after 2008 was the hero and then became the goat after 2011 and 12, and business is very erratic. 2002, down. Recovery, 2008, descent. Recovery, this year, back down. Let me give you the highlights of this year's study. Point one, we are back to trust levels of 2009. Um, what's happened in the general population is that two-thirds of the countries are under 50% trust. We have not seen this since 2009. Among those countries are the UK and the US. The general population is profoundly aggravated. They are 10 points less trusting than the elites. That is consistent for the last two, to year, two and three years. I attribute this to the Piketty thesis of the haves and have-nots. The Elites, half the countries are now in distrust, again, back to 2009. What's happened is it used to be that trust was traded. In other words, NGOs would go up when business would go down, etc. It was like a seesaw. The last two years, we've seen it like a balloon. The air is going out. And this year is profoundly evaporation of trust. We attribute this to the unimaginable events of this year. Let's go through a couple of them. Ebola. Three big air crashes, Sony being hacked by a sovereign nation, continued problems with the banking sector, the foreign exchange scandals. We also um, see you know, continued irritation um, with scandals such as Petrobras in Brazil, where you know, it was a very high flyer company led by Batista, superstar hero, business guy, now bankrupt. So continued disappointments in institutions. And fumbling response to crises lead to evaporation of trust, no longer trust trading. Second point, we now see for the first time that NGOs, which were the fifth estate in global governance, receding in trust. NGOs were a rocket ship going up. This year, we start to see the descent. 10-point drop in Japan, 10-point drop in China, 15-point drop in the UK. Ed will give you reasons. The NGO sector is now actually seen as important enough to take seriously and judge whether it's performing or not. Media. Media's slow descent is problematic. Two-thirds of the countries we survey now have trust in media under 50 percent. Two-thirds of the countries. What's happened with media is that search has now passed mainstream media as the first place you go and the place you go to corroborate stories. That is consistent across all our countries. That is a trend that finally has had the lines cross. Mainstream has been slowly descending. Search has been ascending. The key point for those of us in PR is that which is 
Born digital, which has higher search rank, arguably becomes a more important option for placement, which is a fact, but maybe arguably depressing. Um, we now go to the sector of government. Government has stopped its descent, but it still is at a low level. Only two countries showed, three countries showed significant increases. Russia, for that lovely patriotism, when you invade Ukraine, your rankings go up. Um, India, election, Indonesia, election. Those were the three places where trust rose in government. Everywhere else was stagnation. More or less, the numbers for government are flat. And the numbers are flat at a level 20 points lower than business. In many countries, it's 40 to 50 points difference. South Africa, Mexico, Brazil. Government is still at a very low ebb. Business. Trust in business was having the peace dividend, 2008 through 13. This last year, trust in business went south. In more than half the countries we survey, we actually find trust in business under 50%. We have not seen that number since 2009. Let me try to unpack the business statistics. First, let's look at it by industry sector. Technology has been the bell cow for the entire business sector. It has always been the strongest. It's always been going forward and up. Not this year. It went backward. And it went backward three, four, five points in every country we looked at. Why? Privacy and security. Privacy and security. Sir John hopefully will talk a little bit about that. What's gone also badly? Banks. Banks continue to descend. Banks are terrible in Western Europe continue to be in the 20s or 30% trust. They have recovered in the United States. They have very high rankings in Asia. And the gap between tech and the other industries, automotive and food, has closed. It used to be the tech way ahead. Now it's seven, eight, nine points. The second thing that matters for trust in business is your national identity. What jersey do you wear to the World Cup? If you're a German, Swiss, Swedish, Canadian company, you've got a trust advantage. If you're Mexican, Brazilian, Chinese, or Indian, you've got a huge anchor around your ankles. How bad is the anchor? 30 to 40 points in trust. If you're Lenovo coming to the UK, you come to the game against HP 30 to 40 points worse than the American or British competitor. Why? It's so bad that actually they don't want your factories and they don't want your investment. Only 30% of people in the UK want a Chinese factory or want Chinese to invest in your country. It's pretty bad. Supply chain issues, CSR issues, how you run your business secretly issues, who is Huawei issues, we get all this. Okay, the third thing that matters for you is what's your industry structure? In other words, are you a public company? Are you a family company, et cetera? Family companies in developed markets have a 40-point trust advantage over publicly held companies. You must love to hear that. Um, but let me also tell you that there is great suspicion of wealth. When we talk about the Piketty thesis, I'm going to give you two stats that hopefully will wake you up. 90% of people we survey say they want government to intervene because there's too much of a gap between the wealthy and everybody else. And 90% of people also say the wealthy have too much political influence. Those are enough to make anybody like me who runs a family business a little nervous. What's the last thing, and maybe the most important thing? Leadership. CEOs are not trusted, nor are government officials. They rank ninth and tenth among spokespeople in terms of credibility. Who's the first? Academics. Second is a technical expert. And third, and very important, is a person like you, a peer. Who's the most trusted source of social content? Friends and family. <laughs> Journalists would be 20 points less than a friends and family on social. It's a shocking and stunning finding for this year. But leadership matters, and trust in CEOs, which was recovering from 08 to 12, has settled back down. Again, I think it's totally related to the Piketty thesis of haves and have-nots, the sense of the entitled, and also CEOs have disappeared. They have taken the wrong message from 2008. They have put their heads like this under the parapet, and they're wrong. Those that are leading, Paul Pullman, Howard Schultz, those are the leaders. The ones who are hiding, they're making a big mistake. Now, the last thing, and maybe the most important thing I'm going to talk to you about, we have found something very important about trust in business. Innovation 
which is supposed to be a trust accelerator, is now a trust anchor. People believe that trust, see, people believe that innovation is proceeding too quickly. By a two to one margin, they're afraid of the pace of innovation. They're especially afraid that government, which is supposed to, by a four to one margin, watch over business, only 20% believe government can keep up with business in this area of innovation. What are they afraid of? They're especially afraid of fracking and genetic modification. They're somewhat afraid of electronic heart monitors or you know, the devices you wear around your wrist, Fitbits. Um, they're somewhat afraid of cloud computing. They're not afraid of electronic wallets, interestingly. <coughs> There's much more concern in the developed world than there is in the developing. Developing world is like, bring it. Developed world is scared a little. How do you solve this innovation dilemma? Well, share your data. If you've got clinical trials, if you've got something that you can show that makes sure that people believe that the product works and is safe, great. You have to have a privacy standard. You have to have a regulatory format that government can accept that allows you to be regulated. That's why the Uber CEO yesterday in Munich said, you know, we want to be regulated. That's a new theory. The Silicon Valley model of we'll invent it, you'll like it, doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's seen as arrogant and it's also seen as absolutely ignoring side effects like employment effects or other aspects that you know, might be caused by disruption. People don't like disruption. They like the consumer benefit, but they're scared because they're not getting it explained to them. So in short form, what I'm telling you is there's tremendous dispersion of authority. We see a decline of trust in institutions. That which should be rocket fuel for business innovation is actually a trust anchor at the moment because we have failed the essential test of explaining not just the what, but the how and the why. Eduardo, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, so in the UK, the global picture is actually playing out along similar lines. Um, the four main headlines uh, from this year for the UK, the first is that trust is in the doldrums and it's going nowhere fast. The second is that trust in business is on the slide and it's not far off the depths of 2009, just after the financial crisis. The third is in an election year, voters are crying out for honesty from their politicians. The fourth, what the public is looking for across the board is leadership, honesty, fairness, especially in business and in politics. So if we have a look at the data, this slide here shows trust levels in the four institutions, so business, NGOs, government and the media. And you can see that there's no improvement at all on last year, and actually in the case of the NGOs, a significant slide. And I think it's kind of remarkable when you think about the year, because on the face of it, for government and media, it's been pretty good. I mean, taking the media, for example, lots of scoops. So the Times, their expose of child grooming in the north of England. Uh, Martin, the Sunday Times, and his brilliant investigation into Qatar and FIFA corruption. Uh, Channel 4 News, Ed, and your reporting of homegrown jihadis and the rise of Islamic State. And of course, um, Christiane, the CNN coverage and BBC's coverage of international events like Ukraine, the Ebola, Syria. I mean, some brilliant reporting this year, but trust in media is still down three points. Now, for the, the government, it's pretty flat on the year, 42 to 43. No big scandal for government, an improving economic picture, job creation and a rise in real, in real wages, a win in Scotland, but still trust in government is flatlining. Now my hypothesis is that trust is being driven not by outputs or by announcements, it's actually by perceptions around motivation and behaviours. Now the next slide shows how we fare in relative terms with the other 26 countries we survey. Now this is an aggregate <coughs> score of trust in the four institutions. Forgive me because it's quite uh, small on the screen. But what you can see is the UK has fallen from the neutral camp, that's the grey camp on this bar, into distrusters, that's the red camp. And that means the majority of people sampled here distrust the institutions that serve them. Now in the UK, as I've already said, this was um, driven 
uh, in, in a large way by NGOs. So a quick word on NGOs and what's driving a decline in trust there. And the answer isn't simple. It's actually, you can see from this slide, a combination of factors. But there are a couple of things I want to draw out. The first is that there's a feeling that NGOs are now acting too much like business. They're too focused on fundraising, too focused on the money. There's also a view that they've lost touch with the UK. So it seems, certainly for the people we've sampled, charity needs to begin at home. Now, if we go on to the next slide, you'll see how the four institutions have fared over the last seven years. On the far left is 2008, running to 2015. And this, will sh this shows essentially the tracking of trust over, over a sustained period. And you can see we're operating at a pretty narrow band for almost all the institutions. And we are back to kind of 2009 levels. So you could say, in some respects, we're living in the UK in the trust doldrums. So it's election year. Let's have a look at politics briefly. On this slide, the light blue is last year and the dark blue is this year. And you'll see across the board, all the parties are down. Like the polls, Labour and the Tories are neck and neck are on 36%. The biggest losers, perhaps not surprising, given the year, the Lib Dems down six percentage points to just 25% trust. The downside, I don't know, I don't know maybe uh, you know, it's a fact of being the less dominant partner in coalition perhaps, but you can see trust levels in UKIP remain a comparative threat to all. So we wanted to ask about trust in political leaders to do what is right. This is the results on this next slide. Boris Johnson is still out there in front, but he's slightly dipped on last year. It may be the prospect of doing two jobs, Mayor of London and also standing as MP. Maybe his critics are right, Adam, that the more exposure and scrutiny he gets to a wider audience, the less trusted he becomes. I, I don't know. Slightly better news for David Cameron. At this stage of the electoral cycle, he's up a point. It's actually now up five percentage points on Ed Miliband. Yet both surely should be worried about the risk of Nigel Farage, the only one of the five main characters here to make significant gains in trust. Now, what I wanted to do then was go another level deeper and ask the public's view about how politicians communicate, whether they communicate honestly and whether they speak their mind. So you'll see on this slide, these are different things. You can speak your mind, but be selective about the information you use. So look at Nigel Farage here. 61% of the public think that he speaks his mind, but only half of those think that he's communicating honestly. Boris Johnson also has got a gap between speaking his mind and perceptions of whether he's communicating honestly. So in my view, um, this demonstrates that it's very, very dangerous to, to underestimate how perceptive voters can be. They know there's a difference between plain speaking and honest speaking. Very briefly on the next slide, an issue that's likely to dominate the next parliament here in the UK, Europe. Now, we asked what impact trust being in or out of Europe would make. The answer, you can see, is split right down the middle. If there's a referendum, like Scotland, it's going to be incredibly close. So with 106 days until election, what should politicians do differently? The principal thing you'll see from this slide is speak honestly. That's 52%. Then there are two key policy areas following afterwards, immigration and Europe. So we wanted to test this result. So we thought we'd go out onto the streets of London to find out what politicians could do to build trust. You mean what they say? Stick to what they say they're going to do? When they say something, to actually do it. Deliver on policies, like stop lying. We just don't know much about everyone else. We don't know about much about their life. They don't really talk about what their background is and we need to know more about that as people like where you know where they come from what their ethics are get themselves out there a bit and just be a bit more with the community i don't know right now i have little trust so i don't know i'll be more truthful by giving answers which aren't just going to repeat the party line please stop insulting your audience the intelligence of your audience i mean it's just so annoying it's just so you know I mean, who do they think we are? <laughs> <laughs> my, by the way, my father is delighted that he's finally got on television. So, um, uh, <laughs> um, 
So, so look, you can see from the street and the survey, the answer is pretty clear. Uh, there needs to be a change in behaviour from our politicians. Honest communications, tell the truth, be clear. It's a pretty simple prescription. Finally, show leadership on the issues that matter as well. Now, look, let's turn briefly to business. And the picture isn't great, as Richard has already alluded to. Uh, this year, we've had tax avoidance, firmly in the headlines, banks fined for foreign exchange manipulation, the unravelling of a great high street brand, Tesco, more concern about executive pay. So I suppose it's no surprise that trust in business has declined. And we're now sitting on the fence between distrusters and trust but also in a pack of countries where there are much lower levels of trust in business. And we're not far off Argentina. Um, but it's not all bad news. And Richard has already mentioned this, but it's just worth dwelling on it for a second. When it comes to the perception of business and where businesses are headquartered, the UK remains a very attractive place to, to be. And you can see from this slide, we sit alongside Switzerland, Germany, and the United States as a trusted place where companies are headquartered. So this is the other 26 countries and their perception of, of companies headquartered in the UK. And in my mind, this puts, um, puts us and UK PLC in a pretty strong position and as a platform for business to lead. Like with government, we wanted to know what business could do to improve trust levels. Here's the answer. Perhaps not much of a surprise either, but nevertheless, let's go with it. So firstly, pay the expected levels of tax. And I think the key word here is expected. Uh, number two, behave responsibly. Three, be transparent in what you do and how you do it. In other words, whilst customer service and quality is still very important, first and foremost, it's all about behaviour change. Now onto the media. I've already mentioned in, that in sort of scoop terms, it was a great year. But the long shadow of phone hacking is still very evident in the UK scores. The overall trust score is 38%. It's worse than in the doldrums, it's going backwards. Now, it's worth remembering that this is an aggregate score. So this is everything from all of the sort of lower end tabloids to mid-market, um, television um, and uh, radio. If we go on to the next slide, you'll see what's interesting is what is um, driving that um, decline in trust. It's not about the editorial, it's about motivations and behaviour. Corruption or fraud? lack of effective regulation, the wrong incentives, all of these issues are still hanging around um, in terms of the, pu the public's perception of the media and whether they trust it or not. So soon I'm going to hand over to Sir John. But first, what levels of trust do we have in the security apparatus of state? How much do we trust the organisation which Sir John Sauls headed up a few months ago? Take a look at this. I think this is really interesting. And this, by the way, was... Uh, pre-Paris. Um, despite the political masters going pretty poorly, the police, the security services, have trust levels that many other institutions can only dream of. When you look across the world, these are genuinely high scores. 70% um, for the police, MI5, 72%, um, uh, MI6, the SIS, 64%. I suspect, actually, if you had the sort of spy agencies as one, it would be closer to 70%. But as I say, these are genuinely very, very high scores. We asked, by the way, it's not on this slide, um, trust levels in the FBI and the CIA. Uh, in this country, it's low 40s. Um, so there's something really interesting, I think, going on. So in summary, I think there are three key findings that I, I want to draw out. Firstly, recognise that it all comes down to the manner in which you behave. It's behaviours that are the key drivers of trust. Having a great social purpose programme only adds to the level of trust if you do the basics, i.e. pay expected levels of tax and behave responsibly. Number two, how you communicate is key. Perceptions of being on message or deliberately dissembling or being on script erode trust. It's improved with honest and transparent communications. Remember, the public know the difference between speaking your mind and honest communications. Three, we should build on the fact that countries around the world view Britain as a trusted place to do business. We've got a well-functioning democracy, a fair and transparent legal system, a free press that continues to hold power to account, a thriving business environment, highly effective NGOs. We are doing something right here, and other people around the world recognise it, and as a, as a result, trust us. So look, that's, um, that's it from Richard and me. Um, let me introduce our speaker, Sir John Sauls. So John has spent his career at the highest levels 
of the diplomatic service and civil service. He joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the late 70s and was posted to Yemen and Syria, working in the Middle East, uh, Middle East until the mid-80s. After various posts covering Europe, he became Foreign Affairs Advisor to Tony Blair. He advised Blair on the Kosovo War, on, good, on the Good Friday Agreement, holding ambassadorial roles in Egypt, Iraq, and the United Nations. As DG for political affairs at the Foreign Office, Sir John was closely involved in advising the successive foreign secretaries on Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Balkans. In 2009, he became chief of the Secret Intelligence Service. As an outsider, amongst many successes, he delivered organizational and structural transformation of the service, a very big culture change program. Actually, one of his first decisions at MI6 was for the office to become open plan. Sir John's always been an advocate for transparency, and most recently he surprised Lionel Barber, the editor of the Financial Times, by offering to do an interview on the record. Why, he was asked. Why well, he said it was better in a post-Snowden world that the agency should explain why it was necessary. Now, Sir John has now joined um, Macro Advisory Partners. It's a geopolitical risk group. He's chairman and partner. He's going to join the firm in about a month's time, I believe. So with that, Sir John, I'd like to ask you to come and make your remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ed. Um, I hope I've only got another couple of weeks to wait until I'm allowed to start up a new life, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the transition from the uh, 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 public service to, to the private sector. Um, I was very struck by the one of your later slides about the trust in the intelligence and security agencies. I think this is, um, this is very reassuring. I think, the, uh, obviously, we all do a difficult job trying to maintain security, but the purpose of having police and security services is abundantly clear and only drawn out even more so by events in, in uh, France and Belgium in the last, uh, last couple of weeks. And I think part of um, gaining trust is to be seen to be contributing effectively to a, a public good, especially one that is under uh, threat. Um, of course, having a good track record helps uh, as well, and intelligence in the UK certainly does have a good track record, whether it's uh, uh, Enigma in the Second World War, whether it's the uh, maintaining, so understanding of Soviet intentions during the Cold War, uh, or whether it's dealing with the modern threats of uh, terrorism and cyber. So uh, the uh, the public good, the uh, uh, effectiveness, and also the way in which we go about our business. Being innovative, thorough, uh, acting within the law, an important part of this, and also being skillful and clever rather than violent and thuggish. Uh, I think these are all, uh, all uh, uh, helpful, and of course we're favourably represented in popular fiction, um, as we all know. So uh, I think all this helps win uh, support and trust. And trust for us gives us the license to operate. If the Foreign Secretary doesn't have trust in the leadership of the service, well, he won't authorise the risky operations that we do on behalf of the country. If our staff don't have trust in us, that, we, that they are uh, uh, protected and uh, their, their safety and security is looked after, then uh, they're not going to carry out those risky operations for us uh, in the field. And above all, the trust of the secret agents who operate on our behalf in very exposed positions, because if they're um, uh, uh, role is compromised, then they face arrest and torture or death. So uh, it's really important that we have trust generally from our immediate stakeholders and also trust from the public and parliament that the uh, unique authorities and powers that they've given to the intelligence services are being used for the purposes intended and, as I say, uh, within the law. As agencies, we, we lacked one traditional way of uh, building trust, and that's uh, transparency. Um, the, uh, of course, you can't gather secret intelligence if, you, if you're operating openly. <clears throat> but there does have to be some understanding, a popular understanding, of the powers that the intelligence services have. When I look back on the uh, Snowden uh, episode, he gained some traction because the public didn't know that GCHQ and the National Security Agency in the US could monitor traffic on the internet in the way that they could. Of course, there's a dilemma here because the general public and politicians 
and the technology companies to some extent, they want us to be able to monitor the activities of terrorists and, and other evildoers, but they don't want their own activities to be open to any such monitoring. Um, I think one benefit of the last 18 months debate is people now understand that's simply not possible. And there has to be some form of, of uh, 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 ability to cover uh, uh, um, communications that are made uh, through modern technology. Uh, the Prime Minister must have been right when he was saying last week that you can't afford to have uh, complete no-go areas. We can't have no-go areas in our communities where the police can't go because that just allows space, uh, room for the evildoers to do their, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, ply their trades. Uh, and it's the same in the, uh, in the virtual world. If you allow areas which are completely impenetrable, then okay, you might feel comfortable that your uh, communications are private and no one else can see them, but so are those who are trying to do you down and trying to undermine your society. When Ed asked me to uh, give this talk, he, he suggested that um, I talk a bit about some of the challenges I faced in, in MI6 uh, when I became chief in 2009. And it's an amazing organisation which just does amazing things, uh, but its trust uh, uh, was under some challenge. The service's confidence in itself was a bit in decline in the wake of the allegations of complicity and torture in the faulty intelligence on Iraq. And part of my role, one of the reasons I was brought in as the first outsider, was to try and turn around this trend. So what did I do? Um, well, the first thing is to recognise that some of the criticisms might have some validity. Uh, you can't just um, say that they're all wrong, they don't understand, and adopt a defensive mindset. Uh, and the need for secrecy in a secret world is real, but it also can be a convenient shelter, and you have to distinguish uh, between the two when dealing with these allegations. So um, uh, I had to change that defensive mindset. We had to be more open with those who were in inquiring into our past activities. Had to, instead of just giving them a great sort of dump load of documents, you had to help them navigate through them so they could actually understand what happened, uh, whether it reflected well on you or, or not. And I think that helped build up trust amongst the police, the, uh, uh, the uh, judicial investigations and so on, and, and amongst the parliamentary committee. And we had to recognise that our compliance and legal capability wasn't something that was in a, uh, in a box which you applied when you needed to apply. Compliance had to become something that ran through the organisation like Brighton Rock. It had, it, uh, compliance is an essential enabler of everything that we do. It's not some afterthought that you do once you've worked out the, the, uh, all the details of the secret operation. I think that applies more widely. And we had to address the question of confidence in the intelligence product uh, openly with our customers and improve the validation of, of agents and the rigorous assessment of the material that uh, let us down uh, and let uh, uh, the British government down uh, over, over Iraq. But it's not good just putting your house in order. Uh, your staff need to know that they're part of a modern organisation. And Thank you, Ed, for what you said. Um, it wasn't just about going open plan. It was about a root and branch modernisation of the whole organisation, changing the leadership, changing the way in which we uh, 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 managed our people, uh, raised the right sort of talent to the top, professionalising corporate and technology roles, upgrading skills, giving staff more control over their careers, and connecting us better to the rest of government, and making sure that the three intelligence agencies in this country were properly joined up so there was a, an integrated effort uh, rather than a stovepiped effort against the threats that we face. Now, I didn't do all this myself. Uh, no leader can possibly do that. But you do set the tone as a leader, and you back the modernizers in the organization so that those who are trying to move the organization forward know they've got top cover, and those who are digging their heels in, those who want to uh, keep it as it was when they were young, uh, they know that they're being progressively uh, marginalized. And this did all amount to a change of culture. I didn't set out in 2009 to change the culture, but when I look back, I think that is what has happened over the last five years. So that's what you do internally, and then externally you've got to, uh, we strengthen the oversight, um, ministerial approvals uh, greatly increase so that the Foreign Secretary knew in more detail what we were doing, um, the uh, broadening the role of the commissioners. Uh, we actually have two high, uh, very senior judges who are carrying out an ongoing judge-led review into the works of the intelligence services. I don't think that's fully appreciated, just how important and how valuable and how it keeps us on the right path. Um, under all the pressures that we are under. 
And of course, we've seen the powers of the Parliamentary Committee uh, enhanced, and we've seen Malcolm Rifkind uh, play a, a very effective role as chairman of the committee and distinguishing between valid criticisms of the agencies and those which are, are misplaced. And then lastly, it was a question of opening up, opening up the service. Um, uh, I gave the, uh, a speech about five years ago, uh, which was one of the, uh, uh, the first time the chief of the service has stepped out of the shadows. We had a hearing in public of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and we've invited into the service many more parliamentarians and media and judges and people who have impact on, our, uh, on, our, on the climate and the environment in which we work in order to try to build trust and understanding of the challenges we face, some of the successes we've had, and the reasons for some uh, which have been not so successful. And the result of all this, I think, was increased trust uh, in the service as a whole, increased support from ministers, including from the Treasury, which have been increasing uh, and helping us with, uh, with the budget. We've had a greater impact in the service's work. Uh, there's been increased innovation. And although it took a few years to come about, there's been a, a, a much higher morale in the service as well, because all these benefits are seen to be uh, 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 leading the service into a better place. And I think this was done in time uh, before trust corroded far enough to make it hard to regain. Um, and I'm glad to see that the figures are high. I'm not surprised MI5 is a bit higher than ours, uh, but because they have a more singular purpose, more publicly understood. MI6, by its nature, is bred more uh, over a wider range of issues and is a bit more in the shadows. But uh, it's very, very uh, reassuring that we have that level of support. What do you think? That's the arcane world of intelligence. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? Um, well, I think there are some lessons in here. I think it's harder for us all to find our way through the maze of opportunities and challenges that we face in the world today. There are some fantastic opportunities out there for business and for governments uh, with uh, uh, the rise of China, the, the uh, uh, modernization of India, the, um, uh, the, the renewed growth in the US, uh, fall in the oil price. These are, these are pose challenges, but they also pose huge opportunities. And I'm very actually optimistic that the younger generation, I've got three children of my own, um, who are going to be living in a, in a very dynamic world with technology reducing costs and new ways of working benefiting the skilled uh, and the educated. But they're going to be working in a world which is much more complex and less predictable. Power is much more dispersed and fragmented. We see new threats which we don't quite know how to deal with yet, whether it's the terrorist threat uh, exemplified in the last two weeks or the cyber threat, much harder to visualize, to work out how best to respond, but posing an even bigger cost on business. And we're seeing this interplay between markets and politics, which to some extent has been there before, but it's much more enhanced and is much sharper than it was before. I think not helped by the way that regulation and intervention in markets by uh, uh, regulatory bodies and, and uh, government leaders disguises the pressures so that when change comes, it's sudden and quite dramatic. And we've seen three in the last month with the fall in the oil price, the uh, collapse of the ruble, and the surge in the Swiss franc. Um, and uh, Richard mentioned the anxiety around technology uh, and technology running ahead of people's comfort. Um, uh, I think this is something which all of us as leaders have to recognize that technology is a great enabler, uh, especially for people within your organization, uh, but it does um, uh, leave people anxious and uncertain because a lot of people, especially those over a certain age, have difficulty understanding uh, some of the new technologies that are coming in. The, uh, I, I think what this means, it's harder for us all to navigate our way in a world where markets and politics are more closely intertwined and where security and economics reflect and, and interact with one another. You can't separate them into two baskets. We saw that very clearly in the Ukraine crisis uh, last year. Early on, people were, uh, business people were saying, that's not very interesting to me. Investors weren't particularly interested in the Ukraine crisis. Why should I be bothered with that? But then as we saw it unfold with the reaction of Western governments, the reaction of the Russians, the shooting down of MH17, the, um, uh, uh, the sanctions, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the growing uh, confrontation and differences between Russia on the one hand and, and Europe and the United States on the other, 
uh, suddenly business got much more interested. And the level of Russia's integration with the European economy, with, inter with global markets, means that you couldn't just deal with Russia as you could in the Soviet Union when it was uh, largely separate. And we're seeing in Europe this year, uh, we're seeing uh, a, a range of pressures which are on the plate of, of Prime Minister Cameron, President Hollande and Chancellor Merkel and all the other European leaders. We're seeing a new Eurozone crisis, limited to Greece for now. Um, you're seeing the threat of deflation. You're seeing an increased terror threat. You're seeing the awkwardness of finding a way through on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And all this in the context of the rise of populist parties, which is making very difficult for politicians to manage all these things at the same time. And it's very tough for business leaders as well as it is for political leaders. It's a more fragmented, un fragmented uncertain and volatile world. And it puts a greater burden on anyone who's leading an institution in the modern world. You have to understand the complexities of this macro picture and be adaptive in leading the organizations in changing and adjusting to it. And, and, and this brings us back to leadership, really, because the, the nature of a modern leader of any sort of organization is one that uh, is going to have to be open-minded to all these new pressures that they're under, can't just focus on the narrow issues of their business because you can't stay in your lane. In the same way that MI6 couldn't stay in its lane, no public organization, no public company can just stay in its lane and shelter from these storms because we're all affected by the way in which uh, the politics and markets are interrelating with one another. And you, you need to retain the trust of your customers and the staff. You need to see you as honest, fair-minded, not greedy, uh, not selfish, um, and uh, genuinely authentic in the way that you are going around uh, your, your work. And I think all these changes, it's partly um, uh, uh, the way our societies are developing and demanding more accountability. That, in return, I think, is partly a consequence of the much wider range of information outlets that uh, people have. People still have trust in the BBC, but they verify it, or so they think, by checking on, uh, on uh, various blogs and, and uh, 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 other um, informal um, means of, of uh, information dissemination uh, to see if they think that's right. And they seek the information that agrees with their, with, their, with their predispositions. So I think technology and the new politics are changing the relationship between uh, leaders and those they lead. And that's happening in the private sector in the same way as it's happening in government and the public sector. We have to recognize this and adapt to it and not try and fight it, because you're not going to win if you try and stand against that particular tide. And legitimacy of leaders is increasingly central. You can't exercise sustained authority without being seen to be legitimate. Your power doesn't come from your position or your title. It comes from people's perception of you as legitimate in your position. And that requires, that legitimacy requires uh, personal discipline, adherence to the values that people look for from their leaders, and as I say, uh, authenticity. Certainly, if you're not authentic, if you talk one talk and walk another walk, then you're going to be found out by the modern technology. Transparency is the second big area. So discipline, adherence to values is the first. Transparency is the second. And the boundaries of transparency are always being pushed out. If you think you're being more transparent than you were last year, well, that's good, but you still may not be doing enough because there's ever um, almost insatiable demands for transparency to check uh, that the data and the, uh, the facts are reflective of what you're saying. And thirdly, it's about agility to adapt rapidly to new situations while having the confidence your teams are going to follow you. Um, and that's uh, all, all rooted in trust. And I think, fourthly, your work needs to be improving ordinary people's lives. Uh, and that's one reason, as I said at the beginning, why I think we were enhanced. Uh, we have a very strong public standing, because people understand that security is vital for them. It's a global good which enables them to exercise their private freedoms. Now, perhaps it's easier for us than it is for many others. But there are other global public goods like health and education and, and freedom of expression and transport, uh, you know, e ease of uh, uh, transport uh, that can, uh, a lot of people can lock into as the public good that they are contributing to. 
So trust is a key component for all this. I think in the modern era, we've lost the presumption of trust. Lust, trust now has to be built and maintained, and you can't just assume it. You need to show trust in order to win trust. Uh, you have to invest that your trust in other people, and then people will trust in you. And trust creates your opportunity, and if you lose it, that signals your downfall. Thanks very much. So John, thank you very much for what was a very wide-ranging and comprehensive set of remarks um, this morning. Um, we'll, we'll have a, we've got a Q&A, about 20 minutes for Q&A, but if I could ask the first question. Um, you've already touched a little bit in your remarks about why you think um, the UK um, uh, uh, security agencies score so well in trust scores. Of course, that's not the case all the way around the world. I've mentioned um, perceptions of the FBI and the CIA. What are the cultural differences you've seen in terms of how the, the spy agencies are perceived around the world? <laughs> well, um, I think we have been fortunate in this country that, uh, uh, that success has bred success. I think when you have high public standing, you're seen as an effective organisation, you attract good quality people who want to stay and uh, contribute to the work that you're doing. And uh, that breeds a virtuous circle uh, where you get the right people in, they do the right things, and they do them effectively, and you produce the results. So that's definitely one thing that's helped. Um, I think, uh, uh, secondly, in the UK, we have stayed uh, uh, in the lane of, of our professional responsibilities. I think one of the problems for the CIA has been that it's become involved in uh, lethal operations, um, and that has, uh, that has muddied some of the work of intelligence agencies. We've been very clear. Our role is to produce intelligence. Of course, we support the military, but if there's any kinetic operation to be done, it's done by the military under military authorization and not done within the intelligence world. And I think people understand and respect that. And um, <clears throat> uh, I think the, the uh, uh, continued track record of the success of the intelligence agencies uh, has contributed a great deal to maintaining that, that high impact. Of course, we've had uh, a ghastly terrorist attack here in 2005, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but the public know that that wasn't one attempt that happened to get through. Uh, it was one of scores of attempts uh, to uh, uh, launch terrorist attacks in this country. Um, and that there's a real danger, again, as we saw last, uh, uh, earlier this month, of these attacks getting through. So um, effectiveness in delivering that public good, maintaining a high reputation, um, is a, it, it reinforces itself. Good. Can I take some questions from the floor? There's a question here at the front. Yeah. Oh, we'll get, a, we'll get a microphone to you. Media always, oh, media always gets in first. Well done. Sorry. <laughs> um, Deborah Haynes from The Times. Um, uh, get looking at the sort of intentions and, um, and plots of jihadists in mm. places like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, um, and elsewhere, um, do you believe that an attack against Britain or a British target overseas is, is inevitable? And are you worried that MI6 is overstretched, given the diversity that we're seeing of, of the threats? Um, <coughs> well, the... I think Andrew Parker, the uh, Director General of MI5, spoke to this only a week or so ago. And uh, uh, I don't claim to be uh, up to date. I'm not uh, going in for weekly briefings on these things. Um, so he's much more authoritative than I can be. But we have seen a trend over the last two years of, um, of, the, uh, of the threat rising. The formal threat level has gone up, which says that a terrorist attack is highly likely. That's not saying an attempt at a terrorist attack is highly likely. It's saying a terrorist attack getting through is highly likely. Um, and we have to take that, uh, uh, words, those words at, uh, at face value. Um, when you've got hundreds of people going out to places like Syria and Iraq and coming back, I think the great majority of them are probably mightily relieved to get back um, and uh, uh, don't have the intention to uh, go into terrorism. But there will be a hardened uh, core who are absorbed into uh, extremist um, uh, ideology and training when they're out in places like Syria <clears throat> will pose a real threat to us back here. Um, 
Uh, and uh, the MI5 and police, uh, with our support and GCHQ's support, I think the, the security community has done a fantastic job keeping these threats at bay. And every week you report in your newspapers of new uh, terrorist suspects being arrested and terrorists being put on trial and convicted. Uh, that's because there's quite a lot of it out there. And if I was to sit here and say, will um, the, uh, uh, the goalkeepers of uh, the security services and the police keep every single uh, attempt to uh, get the ball into the net out? No. At some point, these threats will get through and there'll be another terrorist attack in this country. Okay. Jamie, we've been... got a... Um... No, that's right. Yeah, John, in addition yeah. to, to your work in intelligence, you've also been on the policymaking mm -hmm. side, so I wondered if you could combine your thinking on this question. Do you think the current approach to defeating ISIS is adequate? Well, uh, I don't want to get into, into this area, and I certainly don't want to say anything which um, uh, 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 would be sort of seen as, as uh, critical or distancing myself from current government policies. I, I, I think it's a very difficult issue. Um, uh, people criticize uh, uh, the, the Britain and the United States on Iraq because of the scale of the intervention um, and because of the, um, uh, uh, you know, the full-blooded effort to rebuild Iraq with security forces on the ground. They're criticized for Libya for avoiding that particular approach and uh, helping change the government, but leaving it for the Libyans on the ground to, uh, to um, rebuild their country, which they singularly failed to do. Um, and we're criticized in Syria uh, because we've taken neither of those approaches and there's been a, a, a popular preference for non-intervention. Um, and uh, 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 that hasn't worked either. Uh, so these issues, I, I, I think, uh, they're extraordinarily difficult to get right. Um, and I think we beat ourselves up a bit too much if we think it's our responsibility to resolve all these problems. Sometimes you can't resolve these problems. They have to be resolved by the people on the ground. Now, I'm not the least bit attracted or uh, sanguine about the scale of the problems in Syria, massive humanitarian nice. losses. Uh, well, um, it's the, the two are closely interlinked. Um, uh, I think ISIS is, a, is the sort of latest phenomenon in the Islamic world. And, uh, there have been some very interesting writings recently um, uh, uh, and uh, comments by people, including, uh, interestingly, President Sisi of Egypt, uh, recognizing there's responsibility of Muslims to modernize their thinking uh, about traditional, how, how traditional positions in Islam equate to the modern world. Because at the moment, some of those, uh, uh, those traditional rulings, as they're being uh, cited and repeated, are reinforcing the jihadist, um, uh, jihadist uh, approach. I have to say, uh, also, there is a, re a requirement for some restraint on uh, the side of those of us in the West. I rather agree with the Pope that, um, of course, uh, 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 the attacks in, in Paris are completely unacceptable but, uh, and uh, can, cannot be justified on any basis whatsoever. But I think respect for other people's religion is also an important part of this. Uh, in, if you show disrespect for others' core values, then you're going to provoke an angry response. Um, that doesn't justify anything, but I think we just need to bear it in mind. Okay, I'm going to take a question over there, and then I'm going to take a question from Frank Gardner um, over here on the left. After that. Thanks very much, Kiesla Stewart. Uh, uh, I'm now on the Labour MP. Hi, John. Hi, <laughs> We just come back from Iraq, where we actually looked uh, at the way we're training uh, the Peshmerga. Mm. And what I was struck by was the thinness of the FCO representation. And surely the intelligence services can't operate properly uh, if we don't also have a real working network uh, on part of the FCO, which you can link into. Has that been cut back so much that actually the intelligence gathering is really compromised by that? Well, uh, <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're tensing me down various roads there, Gisela. I, I'm sure if you've been out there recently, you'll be able to uh, make your recommendations as the Foreign Affairs Committee as to, uh, as to um, uh, uh, the, the, the level of investment we should make there. And the fact is that austerity across government has uh, uh, impacted uh, all government departments. And you can't um, reduce a department's budget 
and expected to have the same numbers of people doing the same work around the world as they were, as, as they were before. Some tough decisions have to be made. Um, and I think actually of, of, under the previous government in Iraq, it was very difficult to get any traction in Iraq and to have any impact for the investments you were making there. And so most government agencies reduce their levels of investment in, uh, in, in Arab Iraq anyway. In Kurdish Iraq, it's uh, slightly different. Um, uh, but under the new government and the new priorities there, obviously it's right to, uh, to recalibrate the priorities that you apply. So I'm not going to uh, get into political debates as to, uh, or criticize my former employers on, on these things. Um, they're, they're difficult issues to get right, but you have to constantly re-examine them. So I think there's a question from Frank Gardner. John, if you could turn back the clock to 2011 mm. and the start of the Syrian conflict, and there weren't hundreds of European, including British jihadists, going out there, what would you do differently? What advice would you be giving to the government to do things differently from the way it's been done? Well, uh, Frank, um, I think you actually have to start back at the start of the so-called Arab Spring. Um, uh, you and I were in Egypt at the same time uh, back uh, a decade or so ago. And um, uh, the, the hopes that were ignited in um, Tahrir Square in uh, the beginning of uh, 2011, I think were always exaggerated. And in a sense, the Western reaction fueled levels of hope uh, which weren't going to be achieved either in Egypt or elsewhere across the Arab world. Uh, a lot of attention now to what's happening in Tunisia. Well, if a, a more fairly run and democratic Tunisia is the only result of, uh, of any benefit uh, that has come from the Arab Spring, it's a, pretty poor, um, it's a pretty poor record. And I think a lot of people got their initial assessment of what this meant um, uh, uh, skewed in, in, in the direction of over-optimism. And that applies to media, applies to think tanks, and applies to many in governments as well. And uh, that thinking, I think, was extended into, into Syria. Now, uh, as I say, uh, the, uh, we could have invested more earlier on in arming the, the military. We could have invested more in terms of controlling space on the ground, as happened, uh, for example, in 1991 in, uh, in Iraq. But the public appetite here for that was very low. And it's pretty low in America as well. And governments, even if we think, even if the elite thinks that this is what we should do, if you can't carry parliament and the public with you, and that was demonstrated in the, uh, whenever it was, the summer of August 2013, was it, um, uh, with the vote in parliament, well, um, you know, uh, you're not going to have a successful policy unless you've got public backing. Uh, because, frankly, um, again, taking us back to the subject of this morning, trust, uh, the uh, public has lost trust in, in the uh, efficacy of those sorts of military interventions in the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan, and to some extent Libya as well. That trust has to be rebuilt. Now, uh, I could think of a number of things that in an ideal world the government could have done that we hadn't done, but if, unless you have that basic trust in government to carry them out effectively, well, uh, it, they're just theoretical options. OK, there's, a, there's another question here on the front. <coughs> uh, question here, sorry. Uh, uh, Jason Groves from Marsh. Um, one of the um, top uh, risks that uh, the, the uh, Edelman survey have identified is cyber, um, is cyber security. Mm. Um, and indeed, it was one of the top risks that um, uh, it was, right, was identified in the Global Risk Report that we published with the World Economic Forum last mm. week and just prior to Davos. What's your perception of the cybersecurity threat to UK business from overseas? Is, is that likely to grow? And, and also, do you, have, um, do you have an opinion on the resilience of UK corporations to, to, to be able to accommodate that threat? I, GCHQ produced a report on this uh, just um, uh, a week or so ago, which I think said that 80% of the uh, major British companies, I think they were looking at the FTSE 100, uh, 80 out of the 100 uh, have suffered major cyber attacks that have cost them, on average, a, I can't remember the exact figure, but a significant sum. I'm sure you can look it up yourself. <coughs> and um, uh, the, uh, this level of cyber threat and cy uh, hostile cyber attacks against uh, UK corporations and, and you know, across the Western world um, has been growing uh, steadily over the last six or seven years. I think corporate understanding of this has grown significantly. 
Uh, I think only five years ago, corporate leaders were going off to um, events in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, exotic places in the Far East and taking all their computers with them, and then were rather surprised when a few weeks later they, uh, they found a cyber attack on their, on, on their servers. Um, I think that sort of naivety is, is, is going away. Um, I think boards have it on their agenda. Uh, uh, I can't think of a FTSE 100 company that wouldn't have the cyber security as a board level risk these days. If there's any left, well, you're behind the times, guys. Um, but I still think it's difficult for boards to understand how they go about these issues. What questions should they be asking? You know, what are their most sensitive data sets? Who might want to try and get hold of them? What is a reasonable level of security? Um, it's one thing to say um, after uh, your company's been victim of a cyber attack, oh, we're going to double the budget on cyber security. Um, that's a useful input. But how are you actually going to use it to best effect? Um, uh, I think cyber defenses, cyber so computer hygiene has got a lot better over the last four or five years. Um, but so have the skills of the hackers and the criminals and the hostile state actors. Um, and uh, uh, as it is in, in, with, uh, uh, with states, so it is with, um, uh, with cyber attacks, it's much easier to bring something down to destroy it than it is to protect it and preserve it and, and, and nurture it. And we've seen these uh, so-called distributed denial of service attacks, i.e. basically bringing down banks and oil companies. Um, and I think it's been demonstrated it's actually quite straightforward for, uh, uh, to carry out these attacks. And the levels of vulnerability are that much higher. So undoubtedly, uh, cybersecurity is an issue for everyone. Um, and uh, uh, <coughs> enhancing uh, the the quality and effectiveness of the approach of leaders, uh, many of whom <laughs> come from a generation which is not that adept, uh, adept, and we can all Google, we all use our computers and our iPads and so on, but are you really adept at the technology that lies behind it? And you also can't just give it to your technology experts, because all you get is a lot of techno babble back from them. Um, and uh, you've got to, as a board, know what questions to ask uh, and be able to navigate your way through um, a, a rapidly growing business so that what you've got suits your, your requirements. And, you know, if I can, uh, 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 I think having seen this threat grow, um, I think it's one of the areas that, uh, 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 if I can give a plug, a new business like ours is bound to be interested in. Richard, can I ask you, you're about to go to Davos. You talk to a lot of business leaders in the US and uh, when you travel around the world. Do you think business leaders are complacent about cyber and the threat of cyber to their businesses? Or do you think Sony was a game changer for them? I, I think they're very conscious of uh, cyber issues, but I think they're unconscious of the issue of the right to privacy. I think that they haven't understood that there's a new compact that's required between the individual and the corporation. And that particularly in Silicon Valley, there's a God-given right to use the data that they have in order to aggregate it and improve their product. And I think that is as big a risk as cyber because the individual doesn't want to be exploited. The individual wants some kind of benefit, wants a trade, wants something that assures them of their right to um, the, the privacy that, that they believe that they are entitled to. And I don't think that companies have really absorbed this, and that's particularly true in what I call the sort of you know, next-gen companies, Uber, Airbnb, and others. And this is where the confrontation comes. But there is a tension there, isn't there, Richard, between the private goods that people expect from their engagement with these companies and the public goods that they want preserved as well. But I think that the choice has to be explicit, not implicit, yeah. that, that someone has to have the right to opt out, and somebody has to be informed of that my data is going to be used unless you opt out. I mean, it, it needs to be much more of a formal um, kind of exchange of information well, as we, opposed to implicit uh, yeah. kind of acceptance. Well, my former employers will be particularly interested in those who opt out. <laughs> 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 now, we've actually only, we, we've only got time for one more question, and I've asked a lot of questions at the front. And actually, there, uh, look, I'm going to take two. I'm going to take Matt Peacock from Vodafone, and I'll take Christian Amonpour. Let's uh, Matt first. Thank you. Um, within the next two years or so, the vast majority of all communications on the planet will be in the form of internet data, including our voice calls and our messaging. 
Um, the vast majority of that internet traffic will be encrypted and the vast majority of that encryption will be held with the key outside the European Union. Uh, in fact, it may not even have a key that's accessible at all, maybe a one-time use key. Um, is that a concern for the agencies? And if so, what should be done about it? Yes, it, of course it's a concern uh, for the agencies. I mean, uh, I can't speak on, on their behalf. It was certainly a, a great concern for me uh, that the... Uh, if you like, the informal cooperation that worked well between most technology companies and communication companies and uh, security services uh, was broken by the uh, Snowden revelations and has not been repaired for some of the reasons, sorry, some of the reasons that, uh, that Richard has set out and that you've set out. Uh, as I said before, um, uh, these new developments in technology and in communications are vastly advantageous to uh, our economies and to our way of life and to uh, family cohesion. I know only too well with two of my three children living overseas just how invaluable some of these uh, things like WhatsApp and, um, and uh, 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 FaceTime and so on can be uh, when you want to keep your family uh, well connected and uh, connect connected with your friends. But if the technology companies allow to be developed areas which are simply impenetrable, you are inviting problems. And uh, we have to find a way as a society whereby the technology companies who are making vast investments, much more than any government can make, in these new technologies, and those responsible for the security of our societies can work together so that uh, the interests of both can be met uh, with limited compromise. Now, I don't believe that there's a trade-off between security and privacy. I think they, are, uh, they, are, uh, they go together. If you, uh, uh, if you have a society which, which uh, evades and abuses privacy, then ultimately there'll be a reaction against it that damages your security. If you don't have any security, then all your basic freedoms are at threat. So we've got to find a way of building the trust in uh, governments and in technology companies that both the, the private uses that people justifiably expect to be able to, uh, uh, to have of these new technologies and the public goods are both being met at the same time. Now, Snowden threw a massive rock in the pool. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ripples from that still haven't died down, but it has provoked a debate on these very difficult issues. I'm not going to prescribe the outcome, but the sort of uh, path you're, um, uh, uh, you're describing, um, which is you know, a very familiar direction of this technology investment, um, uh, tells me that there needs to be some new compact between the technology companies and those who are responsible for security. If we're not to see events like uh, we saw in Paris last week and which we've seen um, uh, also across, you know, in, uh, in Yemen, in Nigeria and so on, become more and more features of our lives. And we can't afford that to happen. Christian, last question. Actually, the questions um, of your fascinating um, discussion, John, I actually wanted to pick up on a couple of things that you have in your trust barometer at Edelman. I was cheekily accused that at the very top of your national trust is the UAE, and I wonder why, given that they don't abide by any of the uh, principles of democracy, human rights, you know, uh, all the values that, that perhaps, that perhaps that, that we appreciate. So I'm really interested in why they're at the top of the trust pyramid. And um, in Britain, you talk about austerity in your services and others. Mm. It seems to me if we have a crisis of trust in our governments and institutions, if intelligence and police are so trusted and obviously so vital, particularly now for the neighborhood to the nation, why could there not be a government, you know, sort of redirection of funds to that area to build it up and keep it as, as, as necessary and, and effective? As but, so, 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 Christian, the... Um, UAE statistic is actually of the UAE people um, and their own trusted institutions, and they feel good because their economy's good. Um, and there's a direct correlation between trust and economic performance. Um, and actually, uh, in acceptance of innovation, too, there's a direct linear relationship between do you like your institutions and do you believe in you know, fracking or other things. Um, and so, I would say, though, <clears throat> that um, the uh, developing market brands, when you go to developed markets, are, are, are terrible. Um, so your intuition is correct um, as to the other's view of that. Um, so 
Um, <clears throat> Do you want to talk about, you don't want to talk about that. Other I mean, I, why don't I, I pick up, why, why don't I pick up your second question in the sort of concluding remarks? I mean, all I, I will say is I suspect after this morning in the last hour, there'll probably be a lot of people leaving the room today that, that would agree with you that the security services um, intelligence gathering actually is a really important arm of government and it's a, clearly an arm of government that the public trust and therefore should be well-funded and well-resourced. I don't think anyone would leave this room disagreeing with that. Um, but look, I, I know we could probably talk all day, actually, and there would be lots of um, questions um, that would just keep, keep on coming. But I do want to thank uh, Richard Edelman. Um, I want to thank Sir John Swords as well. It would be enormously imp impolite of me if I didn't give Sir John Swords a gift. And I know... Um, you know, old habits die hard and, and all of that. But if ever you need a refresher, John, I found this book. It's called The Business of Spying. Um, it was published in 1972. And um, it's, it's got everything in there in case you ever need a refresher. So that's amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs>